doing something here. Verse 3, and God said. Verse 6, and God said. Verse 9, and God said. Verse 11, and God said. Verse 14, and God said. Verse 20, and God said. Verse 24, and God said. Verse 26, and God said. Verse 29, and God said. Verse 31, and God saw. Well, what did he see? Everything he what? Said. But now look what he said in 31. And God saw everything that he had, watch this, made. He saw what he made. But now what was he doing previously? He was saying. But then in 31 it says, and he saw what he had made. Well, there's some type of relationship between what he was saying and the results, what he had made. See, every time God, the reason why it's impossible for him to lie, every time he opens his mouth and says anything, there's enough faith to feel every word that he ever speaks. Wait, wait, hold on a minute. What are, what are words? What are words? What are words? Words. Jesus said, my words are spirit filled with life. Now watch this. Get a picture of this. Words are spiritual containers. Filled with something. God's words are spiritual containers that travel. Like bullets. Bullets can't hurt you if it ain't got no gunpowder in it. Put some gunpowder in it. Put, put, put some gunpowder in the bullets. Load it in the trigger. And it can be explosive. Now it becomes a force. When it's something is a force, it changes and rearranges things. Dynamite is a force. The reason why God cannot lie is because every time he speaks, there's enough faith in every word that he says to bring those words to pass. Which means, if God were to say to you, there will be three-headed dogs by your trash can tomorrow, honey, don't be surprised when you empty your tra trash can tomorrow, you are going to see three-headed dogs. Why? Because God cannot lie because if he spoke it, there's enough faith stuff in those words that he said to bring those words to pass. He, he equipped every word that he's ever spoken with material to bring itself to pass. And so God said, and God said, and God said, and God said, and, God said, and then God saw what he made. All right. Rev might hear what you're saying, but we're trying to learn how to live with what you're trying to say. Well, come on over here to John. Come on. Now let's 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 put this let's put this in a practical content now. See, because somebody said, I got bills to pay. Talk to me. <laughs> don't, 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 be, don't be talking all this faith stuff. Talk to me. I need to know process. If you want me to execute this, talk to me. How can I use everything you said to pay my bills? I got trouble in my marriage. Talk to me, Reverend. John 1. Follow me now. Verse 1. Read it with me. In the beginning, and the Word... And the word in the beginning was what? The word. In the beginning was what? The word. So now if God had to begin with the word, you and I are going to have to start beginning with the word. If God had to begin with the word, you're going to have to start beginning your healing with the word. You're going to have to start beginning your business with the word. You're going to have to start beginning your marriage with the word. You're going to have to start beginning your deliverance with the word. See, you're trying to start something without no seed. That's like a man trying to grow wheat, but he ain't planting nothing. Hear me? So whatever you begin, begin with the Word. And then he goes on and he says, And the Word was with God, and the Word was. Oh, we got us a situation here. And the Word was, and still is, God. Now here he makes himself equal with the Word. Here he says, we're the same. You cannot separate God from his word. 
woman came to me one time in the office. She said, Pastor, the Lord told me to marry this man. Well, praise the Lord, sister. Is he born again? Well, no, Pastor, he's not born again, but the Lord told me. Hold on, sister. No, no, you're lying. You're lying. You're lying, sister. You're lying. Well, how? Well, Pastor, how? You know how, you know, so how you going to tell me that I'm lying? I'll show you how I can tell you. It ain't in the book, baby. It ain't in the book nowhere where God said, go and marry somebody that's not saved. See, we've been putting too much emphasis on the color of who you marry. Oh, let me go. Somebody, somebody said, well, you ought to marry your own kind. Well, I am human. Let me marry my own kind. Black dogs get with white dogs and brown dogs and black horses and yeah, yeah. But when they finish, you still got a horse. You still got a dog. See, we've been putting too much emphasis on that. And let me tell you what racism is. Racism is a spirit of division. Racism wants to divide and conquer. Now, I can't do too much with what the world is concerned, but I'm addressing the church. We cannot let that subtle spirit of racism come into the church and divide and conquer. We are the house of God. We can't let it happen. We cannot let it happen. And some of us, you know, we all right with, with, you know, with a black man or with a white man. Oh, yes, I love blacks. Or, oh, I love whites. But the real test is when the black want to marry your white daughter or when the white boy want to marry your black daughter. Then we go see you. You like them as long as they don't come to Christmas dinner. And that's something you got to deal with in your heart because that spirit of division will hinder the anointing in your life and that anointing won't flow in your life until you get rid of that spirit of division. I, I don't know why we're going there, but I'm trying to teach how to live. Yeah, I'll be glad to say that. And some of you people who are divorced, you might be divorced here, and you can go to heaven divorced, but you can't go divided. The spirit of division is deadly. Oh, dear God, there he is on that. What did the Bible... What does the what does the New Testament have to say about interracial marriages? Absolutely nothing. But now here's what it says about marrying somebody that's not saved. Be ye not unequally yoked together with the unbeliever. That's what it says. Now you can't come to my office and tell me God told you to marry an unsaved man that doesn't have a job. because it's not in the book. Oh, but Pastor Dollar, my biological clock ticking and I just got to have somebody. I, I, I just got to be with somebody on these lonely nights. Honey, you better marry Jesus and learn to let Jesus solve your loneliness problem. <laughs> better turn your biological clock off. Because he said all good and perfect gifts come from the Father above. God don't send no mess. It ain't in his word to send you no mess. So you shouldn't have to settle for any mess. You can do bad by yourself. You don't need to invite somebody in to come and help you do bad.
Oops, I thought I was home. Excuse me. God cannot be separated from his word. God and his word, they are one. Don't you ever say what the Lord told you. And it ain't in the book. Now everybody want to get called by God, but you don't ever want to show up when it's hard. The difference between the called and the chosen, the called are the ones who got the invitation, but the chosen are the ones who keep showing up at prayer time, showing up at tithing time, showing up. Don't come tell me you called and you don't ever show up to do what you've been called to do. Don't tell me you called and you can't go out and knock on somebody's door and get them saved. Don't tell me you called and you're afraid to cast demons out in the name of Jesus. Don't tell me you called because it ain't according to the book. Because when God calls you, he's going to equip you. Wherever the appointment is, you'll find the anointment. You, let, come on, let's get back to the subject. God and his word are one. Now, what's the common denominator? The common denominator is that faith stuff. That same faith stuff that's in God is the same faith stuff that's in his word. Okay, now, let's bring it to practicality. Let this word equal faith. Do you see what I just did? Let this word equals faith. Okay. Habakkuk 2, 4 says, Now the just shall live by his word. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Follow me now. Follow me carefully here now. I know I'm saying something that may, may get me in trouble. I know I'm saying something that people may not like, but I, I've just taken you through the whole thing. You see what I'm getting ready to do here. Romans chapter 1, 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from the word of God to the word of God. As it is written, the just shall live by the word of God. Galatians chapter 3. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident the just shall live by the word of God. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 38. Now the just shall live by the word of God, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Hebrews 11, 1. Now the word of God is the substance of things hoped for. The word of God is the evidence of things not seen. Now I know how to live. I live by the word of God. I handle my finances by the word of God. I raise my children by the word of God. I handle my marriage by the word of God. Whatever I do, I do it by the word of God because the word of God is the substance and contains the substance of things hoped for. And the word of God is the evidence or the amplified calls it the confirmation. The Word of God is the confirmation. The Word of God is the title deed. I like that word confirmation. The word evidence. The Word of God is the evidence. Now, when, when you have evidence, that means that that thing exists somewhere. So if I can find, if the Word of God is my evidence of things not seen, that means if I go to the book and locate the evidence for what has not manifested, once I find the evidence, I have proof of the existence of what has yet manifested. The evidence, the Word of God, is now my confirmation number. You go to a hotel, you want to make sure your assistant gets you a confirmation number. You go into the hotel and you say, I have a room here, my name's Crippler Dollar. Could I check in? Oh, we don't have... We don't have any rooms left. Uh, excuse me, could, could I get that confirmation number? That's my evidence. That's the only thing I have that is proof that there's a room in this hotel somewhere for me. Could I have the confirmation number? 
ma'am, here's my confirmation number. Now, I don't know why you don't have a room for me, but I have evidence that a room somewhere in this hotel, I don't know if you got to build it. I don't know if you got to put somebody out. I don't know what you got to do, but I have confirmation of an existing room for Creflo Dollar. Now, I'm not just going to walk away. I'm going to keep this confirmation in your face until somebody does something to manifest for me what this confirmation says I already have. See, this morning I got dressed with that confirmation on my mind. This morning I got in my car with that confirmation on my mind. I got on my plane with that confirmation. I got out of my plane with that confirmation. I drove to this hotel with that confirmation. And you gonna try to tell me I can't have the manifestation of what I've been holding on to? No, baby, I ain't going nowhere until you manifest and bring to pass what this represents. What are you saying, Brother Dollar? It's time for us to recognize what this word is. It's nothing but a book of evidence, a book of confirmation. It's time for you to get a hold of the only thing that you might be able to see. Get a hold of that word and hold on to that word in the name of Jesus. This is all I got. This is all I can trust. I can't see nothing. I can't touch nothing. I don't even hear nothing, but I got that word and I'm not going to let the devil come and take the only evidence that I have. Now listen, you recall in your mind the time when you let him have the confirmation. You recall in your mind the time that you walked away. You recall in your mind the time that you gave up because the world said it was the end because of what had happened. Honey, I don't care if the building blow up. I got a confirmation that I'm going to hold on to. And if you'll hold on to it, God Almighty, the angels in heaven, the name of Jesus, the Holy Ghost, the anointing of God will come and back you up and push manifestation on you because you refuse to let go of your evidence. Somebody shout! Okay, sit down. All right. Hope you had a good time because this is where it's going to get kind of hard because I'm going to get in your business. Hope you enjoyed yourself. Now listen to this. What most folks call faith isn't faith at all. It's just high expectation of the wrong information. What some folks call faith is not faith at all. It's just high expectation of the wrong information. Faith is this word. The foundation of every faith endeavor is this word. No word, no faith. All right, now, listen carefully. Somebody's lying in the hospital. Sister, what you doing? I'm believing God that by faith he's going to heal me. All right, now, what you have said to me is this. I have evidence of my healing. Because my question to you is going to be, show it to me. I have faith God's going to heal me. Show it to me. I have faith that God's going to prosper me. Show it to me. What book? Where, where's, where's the line? Where's the scripture? Show it to me. Because no word, no faith. 
I have faith that God's going to give me that new house. Show it to me. I got faith God's going to deliver me. Show it to me. See, what you're doing, you're walking around holding on to hope, but you ain't got no material. You hoping God will do it, but you have no material. No word, no faith. And I can't tell you the number of people I have seen going in the hospital saying that they're believing God by faith. They're going to get healed. But I walk in there and another world's on television. And the edge of night is on television. Honey, don't you get it? You're trying to stay out of that other world. You're already hanging on the edge of night. You're admitted to General Hospital. You're being played by a dark shadow. No word, no faith. See, when I say I'm building this building by faith, I can produce the scriptures to you that I am taking the material from. Anytime you say you're doing something by faith and you have no scriptural basis, reference, word, you ain't doing it by faith. There was a deacon's convention, a black deacon's convention. There is a difference. <laughs> See, I've I, I had the preachers come in and say, oh, well, you know, we are all the same. No, we're not. It may be black and white, but we are all the same. No, we are different. Learn to appreciate the difference. I am glad we are not all the same even though we're all Christians we still are not all the same why couldn't be any effective covenant relationships if we were all the same covenant involves exchange that's the only way we're gonna get rid of the weakness that each that we all have is when we recognize the difference because if you're weak in one area and I'm strong in another area our relationship together says that I can now exchange my strengths to get rid of your weaknesses and take your strength to get rid of my weaknesses. That's why I don't understand why preachers across America are fighting one another when we need one another. And listen, listen, listen. I don't need no Buddhist priest. We can't walk together because he don't agree with what I agree with. Don't tell me I can be one with anybody. I can't. He gave his word and his word makes us one. And if you don't believe his word, I can't be one with you. If you believe in Dalai Lama, if you believe in Mohammed, if you believe in Buddha, I can't be one with you. Tired of these little breakfasts we get together and have, talking about, oh, for the sake of oneness. No, you get in the Word and then we can talk about being one. So, praise the Lord. What was I saying? Deacons, black deacons convention. And, and, and the reason why I say that they're different, thank God for the difference. How do you think we'll ever get stronger? Because we're different. Don't be afraid of being different. I'm glad everybody don't preach like me. I'm glad Rob Parsley stand on people's chairs and, and walk on pews and stuff like that. I'm thanking God. Lord, I'm glad you didn't call me to do that because I might fall in front of all them people. So this guy, this deacon was, he, he, he came in and came to, it was right in the oasis. He had to travel in the middle of the desert to get to the oasis. But when he came there, he fell in and the, the doctor was there, examined him, picked him up and discovered the man was dying of thirst. What's the cure for a thirsty man? Water. So they fixed the table up, got a pitcher of nice water, put it in front of the deacon and propped him up and the deacon looked at the water as he was surrounded by the other deacons and he said, I believe if I drink this water, I will not die. And the deacons around him said, well, he said, I believe 
If I drink this water, I'm not going to die. The deacons around him said, mm -hmm, you're preaching now, son. And that deacon stood up and said, oh, I believe if I drink this water, I, 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 I will not die. The people around him said, oh, yes, sir, you showed up preaching now. The deacon got up and stepped up and said, I believe. If I drink this water uh, 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 and fail dead. <laughs> fail dead. Now, let's examine that. What he was saying, was it true or false? True, a man died in the thirst. If he drink water, he's he going to live, right? Well, how come he died? He didn't drink the water. Faith is drinking the water. Don't sit up there saying you believe God gonna heal you. Pick the water up. Drink the water, praise God. Turn to two people and say it's time to drink the water. Okay, now, so we know that just live by faith. To live by faith, we live by the Word. To live by the Word means you got to get the Word. If you don't get the Word in the areas that concern your life, then your ignorance is going to keep you from the success. Now, that's something that I understand, but it doesn't stop there. And that's where... That's where Christians have missed it. They stop right there. And they said, oh, praise God, now we know how to live by faith. Huh? Because I know a lot of people who, who do and have done just what I've taught and just what I've showed you, but it, it doesn't stop there. Faith is a way of life, but faith has to operate within a system. The world has a system of operation. And God has a system of operation. We've forgotten process. How do I process this thing? It's not just enough to say, well, we live by the word of God. How do I process it when I'm sick? How do I process it when, when I am in, in need? What do I do? Now, let's look at the system that faith operates in. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Here's the part the devil hates. Somebody say, he almost finished. Now, we can go ahead and shout. No, sit down, calm down, and listen, listen. listen he hates this part. He can't stand this part. Because now we're getting ready to show you how to do it. How I many of you know Philippians chapter 4 says, My God shall supply. How? Well. I asked how, you told me where. He's going to supply it through and by the anointed Jesus and his anointing. Christ is not Jesus' last name. Am is Jesus' last name. How you figure that? Well, you remember when Moses was in front of the burning bush? He said, who should I say sent me? He said, tell him I am sent you. Well, I figure if the father said, tell him I am sent you, then Jesus am calls the father am, and they come from the am family. <laughs> Jesus am what? Jesus am whatever you need him to be. He's committed to supply your need according to to the riches and glory, but he's going to do it through and by the anointed one and his anointing, Jesus. I can do all things through Christ, translated, the anointed one and his anointing. And now watch this. Oh, God. Verse 31. 
Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? How many of you know those are pretty important items? In fact, what shall we drink? That could be considered a physiological item, something that's necessary to sustain life. Very important. It's important to you. I'll prove to you. You have a job. You go to work. Why? Because you're concerned about what you're going to eat, how you're going to be clothed, what you're going to drink. If you don't believe me, lose your job. And, ask, and, and notice what you're going to ask yourself. How are we going to eat? <laughs> what are we going to drink? How are we going to be clothed? Very important item. For after all these things do the Gentiles see. He says Gentilized minded men or sinners seek these things too for your heavenly father knoweth that you have underline this next word need your heavenly father knoweth that you have need need of all these things the things you talk about but your heavenly father he knows that you have need how many of you here tonight says uh, I have some needs in my life tonight raise your hands I got some things I need. The Father knows about each of those needs. Now I put it together, I said, now wait a minute, Lord. Philippians said you supply my needs, so you have a supply for all of my needs. Matthew says you know about, you know about my need. Well, if you know my need, you're the heavenly father. I mean, a father in the natural, if he knows his children have needs, will do all he can to try to meet the needs of his children. If he's a good father, I'm talking about no deadbeat father. I'm talking about if he's a good father. And I thought about this and I said, Lord, wait a minute. You're the heavenly father. You know I have this need. I know you have the supply. What's up? Somebody said, what did he say? He said, son, you know I have the supply. I know you have the need. What's up? <laughs> Put it right back on me. As, as if I'm missing something. Folks, listen, whenever it's not working, don't look at God, look at yourself. Oh, I know that's a hard reality. Look at yourself. I don't care what happened, look at yourself. And I said, oh, Lord, teach me. Obviously, there's a bridge that needs to be built from your supply to my need. Show me the master key to get my needs met, Lord. Show me how all this faith stuff works with this system. And then he goes to the next verse, and he says something that we have read all of these years and yet have not gotten a hold of. But seek ye first. Now, so let, let, you just proved my point. All these years you've been putting the emphasis on first. And I've never put the emphasis on what he said to see. Oh, yes, amen. Seek ye first, not second, first. This is in the wrong place. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. What am I to seek? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. And I don't have time to go into it, but every time you see righteousness, it's referring to covenant rights. And righteousness is a covenant word. Right. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and what you have a right to, and all these things that you need shall be what? Added unto you. Sounds to me like Jesus has just given the master key to getting your needs met. That's what it sounds like to me. Since you have all these needs, and I know you have these needs, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to first of all do this. I want you to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that you need, I'll add them unto you. Now, hold on a minute, folks. This is a master key issue where getting my needs met are concerned. I do not have time to blow smoke in your ear or to receive smoke in my ear where the kingdom of God is concerned because I need to know practically what it is so I can do it because I got light bills to pay, baby need a pair of shoes, got a light bill due, got a gas bill too, telephone disconnect, wait till my next paycheck is bounced on me, don't be playing with me about what the kingdom of God is. Tell me what it is.
kingdom of God is God's third operation in the third degree on a plane of spiritual reality only in the hypothesis of the left side of heaven say what how you do that don't play with me tell me what it is I gotta get my name in. tell me what it is After years pastor I was afraid to touch the subject People would write thick books, but I, I didn't understand it. They have arguments over it, they lose friends over it, they get attitudes over it. So I figured, I'm, I'm just going to leave the kingdom of God alone and just... <laughs> God showed up one day and says, Son, I want you to begin to teach on the kingdom, kingdom of God. I'm like, oh, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> and so I went to the bookstore and tried to get all the books I could get on the kingdom of God. And I didn't understand any of them. I tried to get, I tried to get tapes on the kingdom of God, and then I didn't understand what they were saying. And the Lord said, close all the books, throw all the tapes away. I said, yes, sir. He said, do you know what the kingdom, do you want to know what the kingdom is? Yeah, Lord, please tell me. He said, it's my way of doing things. I said, well, what is the kingdom of God? He says, my way. I'm the king. So look at the word, King Dom. The dominion is of the king. He do it his way. I looked at the Amplified, and bam, there it was. Seek ye first God's way of doing. Oh, oh no. Nah. Hey, God's way of doing. So I got my Bible out, and I looked at this thing. Come on over here. We're going on this turn. I'm showing you everything. I looked at the thing. I went to Mark chapter 10. I said, let me, all right, let me try this. Let me see what's up here. Let me see. God's way of doing things. All right, let's check it out here. All right. Mark chapter 10. All right, let me go down here, all right? Because all my, I, I, I never, never really, you know, looked at this, but every time they said the kingdom of God, I just thought they were talking about going to heaven. Verse 23, and Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into, not heaven, God's way of doing things. His method of operation. And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and saith unto him, children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into, not heaven, but God's way of doing things. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into, not heaven, God's way of doing things. So that rich man who's been operating his way all these years, it's going to be kind of difficult to get him to change his way of doing things. I, 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 give me some more, Lord. John chapter 3, watch this now. And for the sake of time, I don't have time to go through all of them, but just, just two witnesses here. It's all through the New Testament. He said, the kingdom of God has come. What was he saying? My way of doing things has come. Repent. Change your mind and change your direction. And come on over here. I got a way of doing things. You don't have to do it by the way, world's way anymore. You can divorce the world's way of doing things and come over here to the kingdom of God way of doing things. And you don't have to run into the dead ends you've been running into because my system is in the earth. John 3, 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. I call him Nick. The same came to Jesus by night. Look at there, Nick at night. That ain't bad for a brother, is it? And said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Watch this. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see, comprehend, or understand God's way of doing things. A God that's not born again, he doesn't understand why you pray for those who despitefully use you. He doesn't understand why you bring 10% of your increase and give it to the church. He doesn't understand that stuff. God's way of doing things. Boy, I got to preach in that everywhere I went. And the Lord interrupted me. He said, son, you didn't let me finish. I said, what? He said, I'm trying to define to you what 
kingdom of God is. I said, you said God's well doing things. Praise the Lord. He said, no, no, no. It's not finished until you find out what my way is. What is my way of doing things? Ooh. Genesis chapter 1. What is my way of doing things? What is my method of operation? It's not enough to know that he has a way of doing things without finding out what that way is. Because that's what he's telling us to seek. He's telling us to seek that way. Okay, it's going to get a little strong here, but you'll be all right. You've been doing good so far. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have, watch this, dominion, underline dominion. Now here we're going to see God giving two gifts to man. He gives mankind two gifts. The first gift is dominion or authority. The second gift is found in verse 29. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed. Seed. That's the second gift. Seed. Seed and dominion. Now I thought, my goodness, what can a man do with seed and dominion? What can a man do with authority and seed? Because if you have the authority to plant the seed, you can now determine your own outcome in life. And here's what I saw. If I'll take my dominion and if I'll take my seed, I don't have to kiss nobody's tail anymore to get ahead in life. Because with dominion and authority and seed, I can determine my own outcome. I don't have to wait until somebody shows up and give me a break in life. I don't have to wait until the big break comes my way. No, 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 no. I can take my authority and I can sow for my own way and I can make my way prosperous and I can be of good success. I have been given the authority. I have been given the seed. A man's harvest in life is based solely on the seeds that he has sown. Oh, now that's what... It's a trip reality right there. But it's the truth. Now here's, here's, here's where it changed me right here. And we're moving right into the source of true power. Nothing just happens. Gosh. Man, I fought over that. Because I had some things happen. And, and I'm, I'm trying to like, you mean God is my fault? And nobody wants to admit it. Nobody wants to look at things being your fault. But then he took me back over there to the Galatians, and it says, whatever a man saw, that's what he reaps. There are spiritual laws that govern this physical, natural world. Whether it was you, your granddaddy, or his granddaddy, somebody started something by a law, and if you haven't broken it, you still are a recipient of what somebody started by a law. right go to Genesis chapter 8 watch this Genesis chapter 8 verse 22 if you can get this one part here you will get it Genesis 8 22 while the earth remaineth seed time and harvest remaineth Cold and heat remaineth, summer and winter remaineth, day and night shall not cease. Question, is the earth still remaining? Yes. Cold and heat, is it still happening? Yes. Summer and winter, yes. day and night, yes. seed time and harvest. Yes. Yeah, yeah, seed time and harvest. Seed time and harvest. Nothing just happens. Nothing just happens. Somebody say, ooh, look at the ugly baby. The ugly baby did just not, hey, the ugly baby didn't just happen. You had to have an ugly seed to go on some ugly ground to make the ugly baby. Somebody said, oh, there ain't no such thing as no ugly babies. It is in my neighborhood.
See, it didn't just happen. The bad attitude didn't just happen. Seed time and harvest time. Lack didn't just happen. Seed time and harvest time. So you go around talking about what you don't have, but you don't tell everybody that you lay your sorry self on the couch every day looking at reruns of gun smoke because you don't want to get up and spend eight hours looking for a job. See, see time and harvest time. See time and harvest time. Nothing just happens. Nothing just happens. Nothing just happens. Well, Brother Dollar built a uh, 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 $16 million building debt-free. It didn't just happen. I, you know, it didn't happen because God likes me more. God's not a respecter of person. Nothing just happens. You know, you walk around 500 pounds. It didn't just happen. Yeah, blame it on your glands. It didn't just happen. Seed time and harvest time. No gummy bears and all them whoppers you've been eating on the way home from church. It didn't just happen. Do you walk around wobbling and want to blame the, the devil, you know, in the name of Jesus? You know, you're a big old fat preacher and you're talking about, oh, I believe the Lord wants me to sit down right now. No, 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 you're just tired because you're out of shape because you got a big Dunlap over there and, 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 and you want to blame it on God. Seed time and harvest time. Problems in your marriage. Seed time and harvest time. See, until you recognize where you are, you're not going to be able to take the first step to get out of where you are. If a black man continues to blame the white man for where you are, you're not going to ever be able to make progress. You got you to quit doing that. You got to accept the responsibility. Like I did one day, all right, Lord, I will accept the responsibility for where I am. But if I do that, you show me how to get out. And he says, I've given you authority and I've given you seed. And if you will handle the seed and the authority properly, you will get out of any situation that you're in in life. And now watch this. Okay, God, what does that have to do with the kingdom of God? I'm going to say this and then I'm going to show you and then we're going to bring this message to a close. It, it ain't no end to this. You just got to find somewhere to quit. Listen, the kingdom of God is seed time and harvest time. See, I told you, real strange to the ears. It's seed time and harvest time. It's always been seed time and harvest time. Now let me show it to you. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Verse 26, two times he's getting ready to tell us what the kingdom of God is. Kingdom of God involves a man sowing a seed and a man making the harvest. You sowed it, you harvested. Somebody said, well, seed time and harvest just got to do with money. No, this is, how, this is the system. This is how God calling you to live. Everything God has ever done, he's done it based on this system of seed time and harvest time. We put the emphasis on faith, praise the Lord, but then you got to figure out how faith operates according to the system. And if you try to live by faith and, 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 and neglect the system of how it operates, then your faith ain't going to work. All right, now watch this. And he said, so is the kingdom of God. And he said, so is God's way of doing things. Well, how is it? It is as, it is, it is as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day, you know, live like it's supposed to live, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. Then in verse 28, he talks about the law of progression, for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. Now I'm glad he said that because what he's saying is, you can't plant collard green seed today and cook it tomorrow. It's got to go through a process. So I mean, if, if, if you're about to die, don't wait to, to do the kingdom of God system right when the doctor said you got three more hours to live. That's why I said that you shall live by faith, not just pick it up when you need something. You're going to die. You're going to get put out. You're going to lose your car because you have not allowed 
the system to operate according to the law. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put it in the sickle. Now the sickle should never show up until the harvest shows up. He puts in the sickle, why? Because the harvest is come. Notice he says that's what the kingdom of God is. It's having seed and getting a harvest. Seed, time, and harvest. Then he goes again, whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Whereunto shall we liken God's way of doing things? Or with what comparison shall we compare his way of doing things? He said it's like a grain of mustard seed. He said it's like a mustard seed. It's like a seed which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all the herbs and shooteth out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. Listen carefully. He says the kingdom of God, God's way of doing things is sowing a seed and getting a harvest. Seed time and harvest. So now plug that in to Matthew 6.33. Seek ye first, sowing a seed. Man, I like what Dr. Oral Roberts said. He said, before I do anything, I sow a seed and pray in the Spirit. And the Spirit of God spoke to me when he said that. He said, son, did you hear what he said? I said, what did he say? He said, before I do anything, I sow a seed and sow a seed. No, he said, sow a seed and pray in the Spirit. He said, that's what I just said. I sow a seed and I sow a seed. Because when he prayed in the spirit, he was sowing the word seed. All right, now, let's put all of this together now. Seek ye for seed time and harvest time. That's what you have a right to. Yes. The only thing you have a right to manifest is what you've sown. But we've not sown anything, but we've been in great expectation for something. Somebody said, well, I didn't sow nothing, I got something. You got it because somebody was interceding for you somewhere and they were sowing seeds on your behalf. <laughs> nothing happens aside from this system. Now watch this. Oh, God, may it bless them like it blessed and changed me. Two scriptures, Matthew 17 and Luke 17. My God, my God, my God. If you could take five hours of this stuff, I could give it to you. But your brain needs to be anointed, so you can't do that. Don't sit up that time. I go on, preacher. No, next thing you know, you be having your little finger up, tiptoeing out here. You just... Okay, turn to your neighbor and say, wake up. Yeah. Everybody got to get this. You got to get this. You got to get this. You got to get this. Get it up. Move around. Let's get it. Let's get it. Let's get it. Let's get it. All right, watch this now. Watch this. Now we're fixing to put the faith with the kingdom of God. Here it is. 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 Some of you people who are walking out, you're walking out at the wrong time. Yeah. Child, you sat here and wasted your time and you're getting ready to walk out of here when the change is about to come. You better stand on a speaker outside in that lobby somewhere, honey. Because God will hold you accountable. You say, Lord, I didn't know how to do it. He said, you a lie. There was a Dominion Camp meeting in 1997 and you walked out right when I was getting ready to tell you what you needed to know to change your life. You were too big, you had to go home and see about your roast. You had to see about your rump roast. Honey, ain't nothing important right now. Well, I got to go to work. Honey, you better call them telling you being late because this may move you from going to work for somebody to owning the company. <laughs> Trying to get you out of your shotgun house and you got to go. I ain't home. What am I doing? Come on. Help me, Taffy, wife of mine. Matthew 17. Now watch this, verse 14. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's a lunatic, sore vexed, for oftentimes he falleth into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples. They could not cure him. 
Then Jesus answered and said, oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil. He departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart, and they said, why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto him, because of your unbelief, and then he tells them what they needed to do to do it. Watch this. For verily I say unto you, Here's the condition. If you have faith, all right, now watch me now, watch me now. If you have the word of God, all right, now, now listen, First Peter says he calls the word of God incorruptible seed. Seed that will always produce, seed that will never fail. If you have the Word of God as a grain of mustard seed, now I'll leave out the descriptive and bring right to the point. If you have the Word as a seed, if you'll take the Word as a seed, you shall say unto this mountain, if you have the Word as a seed, remove hence to yonder place, if you have the Word as a seed, and it shall be, it shall remove, if you have the Word as a seed, and nothing things shall be um, impossible unto you who have the word like a seed. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Got to put it together with something else. Hold on. Luke 17, real quick. Here's a situation where the disciples were saying, oh dear God, increase our faith. How many of you have ever prayed that prayer before? Increase our faith. Now listen to what Jesus, how, how Jesus responded with that. And the and the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, here's the condition. If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this sick of mine, turn your neighbor and ask him, are you sick of yours? <laughs> turn the other side and say, I'm sick of mine. <laughs> no, not really, you're not sick of nothing. If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root and be thou planted in the sea and it should obey you. Now here's what Jesus said. He said, fellas, he said, the problem is not that you need more faith. If you treat the faith you have like a seed, then it should obey you. See, you're trying to get more faith, he said, but you won't treat the faith you got right. Now, here's the key. It's not having faith, but it's how you treat it. It's not having the word, but it's what you do with it. Corn seed in the bag, in the barn, won't produce a corn harvest. Word seed in the Bible on your coffee table in the living room won't produce a harvest. You've got to take the corn seed out the barn, out the bag, and you've got to put it in the ground. Plant it, water it, commit to farm it, name it, be there to harvest it. So likewise, you've got to take the word seed out of the Bible off your coffee table and you got to plant it here's what we've been missing it the system called the kingdom of God requires a man to plant seed he's given us 66 bags of seed we've been playing marbles with our seed instead of planting our seed if you had faith as seed, what does that mean? Well, what do you do with seed? You plant it. What is the ground that will receive word seed? The heart of a man, the spirit of a man. You take the word out the Bible and you put it in the heart of the man. Process. 
How do I get the word from the Bible to my heart? Three entrances to the heart. The eye gate, the ear gate, the mouth gate. The Bible says about the mouth, the tongue is the pen of a ready writer. So you can write the word on the table of your heart every time you open your mouth. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. The Bible says about this word in Proverbs chapter 3, to keep your eyes on that word and to look right on. It says to guard your heart, for out of it flow the forces or the issues that will arrange that life. How do I get the word out of the Bible in my heart? Through my eye gate, through my ear gate, through my mouth gate, through my eyes, it's getting in my heart. Through my ears, it's getting in my heart. Through my mouth, it's getting in my heart. My eyes looking at those videos. My ears hearing those cassette tapes. My mouth talking that word. Now somebody may accuse you of being deep spiritually, but you're not trying to be deep spiritually. You're working on something. I'm not trying to prove to you how much I know. I'm not trying to prove to you that I'm spiritual. I'm trying to get the seed in the ground. I can't have what it says unless I follow the spiritual rules of farming. I've got to plant it. I got to get it in my heart so it will grow. I don't, I don't know how it's going to grow, but it will grow if I get it in the ground. Listen, I went to the doctor. The doctor said, it was news I had to grab myself. He said, Doc, looks like you got cancer of the prostate. It shook me for a minute and I said, Phew. and I remembered in my mind, process. You know what I was saying? I know what to do. But the first thing I did, told my wife. Second thing I did, he said, don't tell nobody else because I don't need nobody else helping me to die. Just keep it quiet. Keep it quiet. I know what to do. I understand process. I understand the system. Now, God going to either show me this stuff works or not. I understand. I got to get the seed in the ground. It'll grow. All right, now watch this. When you're about to die, you ain't got time to look at TV. You ain't got time to look at the golf game. You ain't got time to look at basketball. You ain't, you, you're working on something. If you're really working on something, you ain't got everything else. You just gonna put it aside. I got I'm working on something. Ain't got time to tell jokes. I ain't got time to rub elbows with the buddy. I ain't got time. I got I'm working on something. Life or death. Life or death. I'm working on something. Hey. Got my healing videos. Got my healing cassettes. Mm. Got my healing scriptures. Got me a gallon of water. Hey. Went back to my back room. Close that door up, got my 24-hour tape player, and I begin to bombard the ground through my eye gate, healing, through my ear gate, healing, through my mouth, healing. I said four, six, five, seven, eight times a day while I'm sleeping, it's going in. <laughs> when I wake up, it's going in through my eyes, through my ears, out my mouth, through my eyes, through my ears, out my mouth, through my eyes, through the ears, out my mouth. First day went by. Got up the next day, through my eyes, through my ears, through my mouth, through my eyes, through my ears, through it. All of a sudden, I started seeing myself well, and, and I vision started, you see, because I'm working on something on the inside. I'm getting an image of what I've been saying, what I've been hearing, what I've been seeing, and I couldn't let it go, and fear tried to grip me, and I said, no! And I started saying it, and hearing it, and seeing it, and fear tried, no! Here, see, say, I ain't got time to do nothing else. Here, see, say, here, see, say, here, see, say. I never forget that time when I ripped my shirt open. I said, whoa, man, I'm losing it. What's going on here? And I knew what was on the inside of me was more real than was on my body. And the word became healing to my flesh. And the word came from the spiritual to the physical. Listen. Went back to that doctor. He went to examine and he said, he said, oh, boy, you, you, oh, oh, this is unusual. Oh, I knew it. I knew it before I walked in there. 
talk to me, Doc. What you see, talk to me. He said, I don't see. Talk to me, Doc. Tell me. You a lucky man? No. Luck didn't have nothing to do with this. It was the process. Hey, glory. How my satalabah. Halalabo If you tell me what's wrong, tell me what's going on, Doc. He said, You're healed. He said, I don't see nothing. I don't see a thing. Go, go. And I said, I know the system. I have the word seed. I treated it like a seed. And I now take my sickle and I put it to the harvest. And I gather the harvest in and I bring it in the barns. And now I eat of it. Nothing just happened. We started building that building with no money, but we had plenty of seed. So we blew up the picture of a model of the building. We put it in that little sanctuary and we got our scriptures and we started praying them, saying them. We started hearing them, preaching it, looking at the picture, stretching our hands, and commanding the mountain of debt to go away. <laughs> we had 16 million dollars to go. Mm. The banks wouldn't give us a loan. For no reason, they just didn't do it. Because God wanted us to be able to say, no man built this dome but God only. So we began saying it, hearing it, seeing it, saying it, hearing it, seeing it. Money started coming in. Then we ran into a situation where we needed a million dollars in 10 days. Oh God, Jesus. And I didn't know where it was gonna come from because Taffy and I had just come off vacation and we found we were $70,000 in the hole of the accountant. We didn't reconcile the accounts. And, and we, we're in the hole. And I don't know what to do. And I said, go get my wife. And the Lord said, what are you gonna do? Be a leader or, or walk out? And I was getting ready to say something. He said, before you say a word, the very words that'll come out of your mouth will cause conception. Watch out what you conceive. I walked out in that sanctuary and I stood up and I said, we have more than enough to pay every bill that comes into this ministry. We have more than enough. And all of a sudden the Spirit of God got on my wife. My wife said, hey, I know what I'll do. I'm going to give away my whole paycheck. Somebody else say, hey, I know what I'll do. I'll put that house aside. I'll build that later. Here. And they start giving their whole paychecks. And they started working extra jobs. And they started selling stuff in their house. And they started doing all kinds of things. And God got into that. We start saying it, seeing it, hearing it, saying it, seeing it, hearing it. And in 10 days, we not only had the money, that million that was due for that month, but we had uh, the 7,700,000 that was due the month after that. And I heard a man say, that if he did it once, he'll do it again. What am I saying? This is a law. It's called the law of receiving. The law of receiving says this, whatever goes through your eyes, whatever goes through your ears, and whatever comes out of your mouth, in abundance, whatever you spend the most time with your eyes, your ears, and your mouth, it will get in your heart. And when acted upon, it will overwhelm and overcome you. That is a law. Now you'll understand this. When we say, don't spend your time looking at soap operas and Playboy station, we're not saying that to be mean to you. We're saying that because whatever you view these eyes into, you are opening the door for it to get in your heart and it becomes the weeds that try to stop what you're working on. When we say to you not to listen to the crazy music about love them and leave them, we're saying to you to do that so that that won't enter into your ear and get in your heart 
and become weeds that will stop what you're working on. When we say to you, watch your tongue, don't speak foolish things, we're saying that so you won't write it on your heart and it create weeds to stop what you are working on. We are trying to get you to understand that if you want to on purpose see manifestation, then you got to do your part. But I have found that some people don't have time to get blessed. Some people don't have time to speak it and to see it and to say it. You still want that welfare blessing. You still want that microwave blessing. Well, folks, I'm telling you, we're not dealing with a microwave God. You have got to get yourself in a position where you take hold of what you're responsible for and make your way prosperous and have good success and quit blaming the devil for everything that's going on in your life. Hallelujah! Now listen. I charge you in the name of Jesus, I double dog dare you. Triple Dino Scooby Doo dare you to take hold of your destiny, to get this word and to spend time with this word and take faith and make it operate according to the system. Sow the word into the kingdom of God's system and these things shall be added unto you. I dare you. God didn't call you to kiss the devil's tail. He called you to kick it. The source of true power is the word seed deposited into a man's heart coming out of his mouth until the force of faith is released to create what is not seen and bring it into this physical realm where it can be seen, touched, and you say, there it is. We've been preaching, folks, but now we got to produce something. The world's heard us preach, now we got to produce something. We got to become process-minded, and we got to know how to do it. See, so you sitting back feeling sorry for yourself. Feeling sorry for yourself ain't going to help you get out of your dilemma. You got to do something. You got to take hold of things, and you got to make it happen. Now, bow your heads right where you are. Right where you are. Something supernatural is about to take place. Listen to me carefully. If you're here tonight, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior. In fact, look at me. I don't, I don't, you don't even have to buy here. Look, look here. Get, get your eyes wide open. If you want to make Jesus your Lord, and, and for a moment, just no music. I, I, want, I want to do something here. I want to show you something about quality decision. And we're going to play music and we're going to do all this stuff in a minute. Listen. If you were to die right now, where would you spend eternity? In heaven or hell? Because what happens is this. Everybody thinks it's okay until they die. And when a man dies, his flesh, his body returns to the dust of the earth, his spirit and soul comes out, and he now sees spiritual reality. He sees that there's a heaven, he sees that there's a hell, he sees that there are angels, he sees that there are demons. He sees the gates of heaven, he sees the gates of hell. And in looking at this, he turns toward heaven, ready to go that way. He says, I want to go that way, only to be snatched back towards hell and reminded that you should have made that decision while you were in your physical body. But now it's too late. You have lost your soul. You have lost your right to make a decision. And the thing that will haunt men is the number of times they came to this church and the opportunity to get born again was presented to them, but they didn't take the opportunity. How many people are lying in their graves right now that didn't take the opportunity? 
Now that's tormenting, to live eternity in hell knowing that you were one decision away, but you didn't take the opportunity. Tonight, I want to give you the opportunity. The opportunity to come out of darkness into the marvelous light and take dominion over your life. Make the decision, because until this word becomes a life, it will never become a reality. Secondly, if you're here, but you've been, you've been born again at one time, but you've not been living according to the word, and you know you ain't been living according to the word. You've been wearing the title, but you haven't been living a life. And you're ready to get out of that. You're ready to, to live according to the word. You're ready to go God's way. You want to rededicate yourself to the Lord and to his word? I want you to do that tonight. Thirdly, if you're here and you've never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues, I tell you, every believer ought to speak in tongues. Why? 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 Because when you speak in tongues, you're praying about things you don't even know about. And your kid could be in trouble and you don't know it, but God says, lend me your tongue. And now you're praying about something that releases an angel to protect that kid. Why would anybody not want to speak in tongues? The second reason you ought to speak in tongues is because when you pray in tongues, it makes wisdom available to you. You got secrets on the inside of you that God wants to bring to your mind and you pull it up like a bucket when you pray in tongues. When you pray in tongues, man, whoo, man, you edify and build your spirit up. You can be down one moment, go and pray in tongues for an hour and come out on fire. Somebody said, well, we thought you were going to slap the demon out of somebody. No, I've already talked the devil out of you. But now you've got to make a decision. What you going to do? What are you prepared to do? Do you continue to wear the religious hat and let everybody think you're that way? Or are you ready for change? Here's what I want you to do. Listen to me very carefully because it's going to take people who are deciding to leave buzzards and start hanging out with eagles. <laughs> Listen to me right now. If you're not born again, and you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life. If you want to rededicate your life to Jesus. If you want the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Just a moment, I want you to come down here. I want you to bring your Bibles and your personal belongings. I want to pray with you. But then, those of you who are standing, you know, I believe if you're going to be good soul winners on the outside of the church, we better start practicing on the inside. I want you, there's some people around you who want to move, but their, their feet feel like it froze to the carpet. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you to turn to them, and I'm, I'm going to ask you to look at them in the face and, and ask them, would you like to be born again? Would you like to rededicate your life? Would you like the baptism of the Holy Spirit? If so, I'll be glad to walk you up there. I'll be glad to go all the way with you. I'll be your keeper. And every person that walks down this aisle, we communicate loudly to the devil, you are a loser. You lost. And let me tell you something, listen, listen, the devil is getting ready to lose mothers, he's getting ready to lose daughters, he's getting ready to lose grandparents, he's getting ready to lose teenagers, he's getting ready to lose, come on, come on, make a loser out of them. Everybody turn to your left, to your right, minister to somebody. Come on guys, do what you do, what you're anointed to do. Minister, ask them if they want to get born again. If you want to get saved, come on down here, bring them on down. Get them on, make a loser out of the devil. 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 Hallelujah. He's losing sons. He's losing daughters. He's losing parents. He lose, he's, lo he, he's losing. He's losing blacks. He's losing whites. He's losing Hispanic. He's losing.
things you could ever do is make a decision to go the way God has designed for you to go the woman with the issue of blood she made a decision she said I shall touch the hem of his garment and I shall be made whole not I might she made a decision and when she made a decision the anointing was released upon her life and that anointing removed the burden and destroyed the yoke. Now tonight, as you have taken the first step, you've made the decision. Virtue has been released. Just like it came out of the hem of the garment, it, it, it has been released out of that word. Somebody say, how do I know that the anointing's been released? Well, the burden will be removed and the yoke will be destroyed. Thank God for your chill bumps. Thank God for, your, for your, your jerks. Thank God for your falling out, but I'm more concerned about how you get up than how you fall out. I'm more concerned about how you wake up tomorrow than what you did here tonight. And this decision promises you that you have heaven's backup. Something's happened on the inside. You'll dream about this word that's been sown in your heart. You'll get images about it. In a hard time, it'll come up. This is something that is supernatural. You know, I, even, I thank God for spectacular things. But oh, I thank God for supernatural things because those are the things that will be there in hard times to get you through. I'm gonna pray a prayer that this virtue that you withdrew your decision withdrew the anointing some of your bodies that have been feeling kind of rough yeah I'll say that somebody's being healed right now on the left side of their back the kidney area right now God's healing that right now thank you Lord there's a woman in here who uh, did the British and the monk British led the bread yeah you have lupus and you've been diagnosed with lupus thank you Lord if you lift your hands up, you're going to feel the power of God go through your, yeah, by Krishna the Bar. Yeah, there it is. There it is. There it is. Going through your, yeah, right all the way down through your body. God's healing you of that right now, and you're going to go back and get another report from that doctor in the name of G. Ambrokosha. See that anointing settling in. Yeah, there's a, yeah, by Krishna the Bar. There's a woman in here tonight. You have, I see this right here. 
you now listen I want to be very specific now you have a, a, a knot or a lump on your breast but it's on the left side right between your breast and your armpit well I want you to I want you to lay your hands lay your, listen to me now darling it, it hits you but I want you to lay your hands right where that is oh it's gonna freak you out now and then now, now lift that hand up lift that hand up lift that left hand up now look at it there's the anointing I see it's going through your hands it's going through your shoulders it's, it's on that knot now now the knot's going now the knot's going now look, listen you got your hands on it I mean God's showing you right now he's a healer going 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 God There's a man in here right now, you have uh, had uh, ulcers in your stomach. And those ulcers in your stomach. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lift your hands up right now if that's you. Lift your hands up right now. So you came in here, that pain's been on you all through this service, but notice it's going, it's going. Goodbye, the burden's removed, the yoke's been destroyed. See, that's the anointing of God. See, you know, we had time I'd call everybody up and have them testify. I'm not talking out of my brain, I'm, I'm talking out of my spirit. And, and, and God's showing me these things and it's going on around, it's going on all around. Yeah, I'll, I'll say that, there's a, that either brand or the cross, fibroid tumors around some woman's uh, uterus or womb area fibro I, I, I know that woman's in here is, is that you lift both your hands up sugar lift your hands up right now now the power of God let it come over her right now let it come over her I command the burden to be removed and I yeah yep yeah, there it is 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 you're gone it's 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 gone oh yeah la grande and the moho summer and the lecre yeah oh oh yeah 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 my friend and the boss said they're gone they're cool monday the bubble bread there are several people in here tonight have been suffering from uh from a reoccurring depression and I mean strong depression it's been reoccurring and reoccurring you come you get the victory and then it comes back you come you get a victory and it comes back you've been to doctors you've been to counseling sessions it keeps coming back not not down here's what the Lord says from this night forward you will walk in the joy of the Lord like you have never walked in it before Whew. Yeah, yeah. Somebody say, oh, God, let him call my thing out. No, I don't have to do that. Lift your hands up. The anointing's here. Just go ahead and receive now. Go ahead and receive now. I command every burden to be removed and every yoke to be destroyed all over this sanctuary all over this sanctuary go ahead and get it 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 there it is there it is go ahead and get it go ahead and get it all up in the back of the area go ahead and get it go ahead and get it Woo! thank you jesus thank you jesus thank you jesus Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, feel that anointing. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Woo. Go ahead and bathe in it for a while. It's all right. Go ahead and enjoy that for a while. My goodness, just enjoy it. Woo. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. Oh, oh, my God, my God, my God, my God. Woo! Thank you. Oh. 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 
Oh, medley creep in the mongo to block us up. Oh, yeah, man, in the book. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, let me grin in the Bahasa. Ah. Inhale his presence. Some of you have been having problems breathing. Come on, inhale his presence. Yeah, I've been having sinus problems. I'm, ah, yeah, inhale his presence. Exhale his anointing. Watch that. Look at it. Open up right now. Inhale, exhale. Look at it. Open right now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, bronchitis gone right now in the name of Jesus. Yeah, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Yeah. Oh. Now, Father, I pray that every man, woman, teenager, child that has come up to this altar tonight, they've not only felt and sensed your presence, but as they're ministered to, tonight, I'll declare that they will never be the same again. Whatever is wrong, make it right. Yes. Whatever is wrong, make it right. Now I bind Satan, I bind the devil, and I release the forces of heaven, I release the angels, go! Go! Bring it forth! Now, I'm going to ask pastor to come so he can give instructions on where you need to go and how you need to do it, but you make up in your mind, you're never going back to where God has taken you out of, never, ever, ever again, not ever again in your life, in Jesus. Never again. You make your mind up right now. And let me tell you something. Once you get the victory, and listen, even before the victory comes, hear this now. People, you got to learn how to shout before you can see anything. You got to learn how to shout before you can feel anything. You got to learn how to shout. you to look somebody right in the eye and say I'm saved and I know that I am. to look at somebody else and I want you to tell them I'm full of the Holy Ghost <laughs>
Look over your left shoulder as far as you can. Look back around over your left shoulder. Look back there. Turn back around this way. Look over your right shoulder. That's the last time you look back. You're going forward. You're going forward. I don't want anyone. I don't want anybody to move. Except I want you to make your way back to your seat. I want you to make your way back to your seat. I want everybody else to be seated. Go ahead. Go ahead. Because I got a question to ask you. Come on back to your seat. Now I just got I just got one question. I don't have, just got one question, that's all. Let everybody get back. Ushers ain't nobody going out those doors. There ain't nobody going out those doors unless they're, unless they're going for the squad. And if they are, just lay hands on them. There ain't nobody going out the doors. I travel and have the privilege some years, 150 nights, to preach someplace just like this man has left his church and come here tonight to preach he worked all day and got on an airplane and flew over here and came here just in time to get into the pulpit and he's probably halfway back to the airport by now to get home sleep in his own bed to get up tomorrow and do the same thing again I've done that 150 nights a year and there's nothing that if I see it has any more negative impact or tries to than when I see a bunch of people get up and run out the building knowing that they've made no effort whatsoever they have come in and taken my seed and left their dung and ran out the building and you're not that kind of people these folks are getting back to their seats now I, I, here's the only question I have for you What is the principle of process of the kingdom of God? Seed time and harvest. What's the principle? Seed time and harvest. What's the principle? Seed time and harvest. We're going to sow a beautiful love offering into the ministry of Creflo Dollar. He's on. He's. Well, I don't have to tell you. You're known across the country as the most liberal people there are. That's the reason they pound the door down to preach in here. I want you to bless this ministry tonight. I want you. This is his first time with us. First time with us. And I want, when I call him back next year, I want him to say, yeah, I already marked it on the calendar. I'm just hoping you call. Amen. I want to bless him. I don't want to tip him. I want to bless him. So get an envelope in the pew in front of you or take out your checkbook. If you're making out a check, make it payable to World Harvest Church. Put a WHC because we write him one check. If you need an offering envelope, they're right there. Boy, I don't know, I don't know how you could not apply this principle now. I don't know how you could hear that word and not, and not apply the principle of sowing and reaping right now I, d I just don't un I couldn't comprehend that it wouldn't work for me it just wouldn't work for me so right now get out that seed well I don't have anything to give you're a liar God God never asks for what you don't have that's the reason I don't believe in pledges God never asks for what you don't have he just asks for what you want to keep you missed that you were writing I said God just asked for what you want to keep I want you right now to apply the principle of the kingdom. You know the Bible says that the word is a discerner of the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. The only way that the word can be a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of your heart is if you hear that word and then you make a conscious decision at that point to obey it, heed it, and do it, or whether or not you just reject it and say, well, that was, that was a good sermon. That boy could really string some words together. That, that worked out pretty good. 
Are you here? And then that word discerns that the word you heard you did not count as the word of God and you've walked away from it, therefore it doesn't spring forth the life in your heart like we just heard tonight. Praise God. Hallelujah. While you're riding, I see many on the front row still riding, and I, that usually means the back row hadn't quite started yet. Just go ahead. Hallelujah. Praise God. Boy, I feel good. I just feel that burden removing, yoke destroying, anointing just kind of just settled in there and just everything's all right. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock in this building, God being my help, I'm going to lay hands on every person, every Breakthrough Covenant partner. Now you'll have to, you, you have to be a Breakthrough Covenant partner to get into that service. But we're going to have a time. Gary's going to help me. A lot of these folks are going to help me because I don't want you to leave here without an impartation. And there are different ways to get impartation. But the Bible still says they shall lay hands on the sick. And not only just lay hands on the sick, but lay hands for impartation, for deliverance, for blessing. Amen. For anointing. So just be here tomorrow. Hallelujah. You say, how will you do it? Oh, it'll be a great, great fun thing to do. Hallelujah. Last year, I think we laid hands, Pastor Caden, 4,200 people last year during that service. They didn't even leave. I believe some of them just hung around and got in line again. I think this year I'm going to put something on you so when I lay hands on you, I, I can tell. Already been on there. <laughs> Lord God, how blessed we have been this week. How rich your word has been to us and precious your anointing. How wonderful your presence and we thank you. We come now to honor your servant, to sow a seed that we know is the principle of the kingdom, your way of doing things. Lord, that's how we got into this kingdom, you so to see. You gave your son. So now we give joyfully that this ministry that the world ought to hear will be financed by your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can receive the offering, gentlemen. Praise the Lord. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty. Was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who reigns forevermore. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty. you I do want to remind you these evening services 
We've had over a thousand in the nurseries, a couple thousand in youth, a thousand in the children's ministry, three or four thousand children being ministered to every service around this property. Many of them are your children. I don't think they've been busting them in here. I think some of y'all brought them. Would you just do me as a pastor a favor? When you pick those kids up or you see some of those workers, would you just, could you just thank them? Could you just say, bless you, thank you. It'll mean an awful lot to them. We've got 2,500 volunteers working every one of these services. So please, when you pick up the baby, just say thanks. Will you do it? God bless you. I'll see you in the morning at 10 o'clock. Until then, just stay in the anointing. Blessed be the Lord.